Hello everyone, I hope you're all well. I'm Karen Doyle, Operations Director of CTAM Europe, and I'm here to welcome you and thank you for joining us today. It's great to see this fabulous group on our screens here today. I'm going to introduce you first to Kasia Jablonska, one of CTAM Europe's board members, and then Kasia in turn will welcome the panel and they'll quickly introduce themselves. The session today is due to last around 45 minutes, including a few minutes at the end for questions. So please do get involved and ask via the Q&A button. Members of CTAM Europe can watch the recording of this and our archive of webinars and podcasts on the members only section of ctameurope.com. And I'll follow up with e by email with information on our executive management program, which we are holding live at INSEAD next March. The panelists may also email you directly as they have access to the registration list. So time is short. I'm going to take myself off screen now and let the webinar commence. Enjoy. Hello and welcome. We're meeting on this panel for the second time, which is now fast becoming an annual tradition in order to do a roundup of the current industry trends. Our distinguished guests have attended some of the latest media events so you don't have to. Following from this, they will now share their thoughts and observations with us. What do the industry and it, its events look like in this post-COVID world? First, let them introduce themselves. Guy, would you like to start? Yes, thank you, Cassia. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Guy Bisson. I'm Executive Director and Co-Founder of Ampere Analysis. And following on my screen, Natalie. Hi, everyone. Uh, Natalie Lethbridge. I am founder of Atonic Digital, which is a media advisory firm. And the next one is Maria. Hello, everyone. My name is Maria Ruagete, and I am senior research director at Omdia, part of the group Informatech. Thank and, you for inviting me. And finally, Jonathan. Hi, I'm Jonathan. I'm MD of Workshare Consulting, who focus in uh, growth consulting across product market and the client outreach. So before we start uh, discussing the, the industry trends, I think the first question I would have to all of you is, how is it going back to the events? And the most importantly, are you all going to attend MIPCOM next week? Maria? Very good question, Cassia. Uh, regarding MIPCON, yes, I'm flying on Sunday. Today is Thursday, so in three days. I'm going because I think there is a lot of value in attending in-person events. So when I went uh, to NEM, where I was with these fantastic people here today, with Natalie, Guy, and Jonathan, uh, one month ago, it is true that it's an effort to travel these days. Lots of tests, lots of regulation that keep changing. But because all of us have to put so much effort to attend a physical in-person event, once you are there, everyone is giving 100% or more of themselves. So people uh, have very good quality meetings. They are really engaged with everyone there. They don't spend time in the hotel rooms as they used to do in the past, some of the attendees. So I think more than ever, maybe less people attend to those events, but those that are there is when you get the best meetings, the best conversations, the best leads. So yes, I'm going to MIPCON. I will be there the whole week next week. And I know many of you listening today probably are not even sure, even today, if you want to go or not. So if you can, go, travel there, and I would love to meet you there. Let me know if you are. And I think, uh, well, I will pass it to Jonathan. Are you going, Jonathan? <laughs> yeah, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm off to MIP. Um... I think you're right. You know, before before we went to uh, NEM, um, I'd sort of forgotten how useful in-person events were. There's been a, a plethora of, of virtual events over the last 18 months. Um, you know, everyone's kept really busy in that space. Um, and so sort of in the build-up, we were, you know, a little bit, a bit like I think a lot of people are thinking about MIP now, um, sort of wondering whether it's worth it. Are you going to go? Are you going to get meetings? Is it worth all the, the, the effort and the time and the expense of, of doing all of that? Um, and I'd say, you know, it, it absolutely was uh, the nice thing coming off the back of, of NEM. I've now decided to go to every sort of physical event I possibly can because they were so, so useful. Um, you know, in, in my head, virtual events seem to be quite good in terms of, you know, producing you know, nice information that you can listen to and learn about industry trends. 
Um, but like you, like you said, to echo that, a physical event is about sort of discovery, curation, and, and actually sitting down across the table from somebody who is vested in, in making something out of their time. Uh, I am going to admit, um, I was a little bit concerned about not getting enough meetings, so I kind of went to, went to that with great guns. Now I have 22 meetings across the three and a half days I'm going to be there. Not sure where they fit in. Um, so I'd say if people are a little bit on the fence, yeah, look, people are going, they're very keen to meet. Everyone's a little bit stir crazy from being trapped in the, 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 Zoom, the Zoom office for the, the last 18 months. So people are open and, and, and happy to chat. Jonathan, sorry, if I could interrupt you here. So what would you say if you compare the sort of virtual and the physical attendance? What are the sort of, at the moment, what trends do you see? And you asked that. I actually have uh, a couple of slides I can actually share right now. Let me bring that up for you. Hopefully you can now see um, some lovely data from uh, an industry survey we did uh, earlier in the year. And I know when I showed the, the panelists this, it immediately promoted a bit of discussion. Um, I think what's really interesting is, is when, when we spoke to people who were organizing conferences, um, they sort of indicated that the registrations were doing really, really well. So registrations to virtual events seemed higher um, than physical. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. It's very easy to say yes and then think about the logistics later. Um, there did seem to be a flurry of activity at the start of lockdown, but as time went on, these are the results we sort of started seeing. So you can see that actually average attendance, despite virtual events being easier to get to, dropped so people went to fewer events during lockdown despite it being easier and registrations being higher so that there's definitely a factor there of people not necessarily being in the right headspace um, to do that you know as maria was saying it's, it's about you know effective communication and, and meetings and these virtual events were happening at a time where people had a lot of other things on so they were doing their day-to-day -day and maybe dipping in and out of these events or in fact you know getting getting you know their, their normal work life catching up with them um, and therefore attendance being lower. And if I, if I quickly flick to the next slide, and please guys on the panel, if you wanna jump in on some stats here, um, absolutely do. 64% of people said that virtual events are worse than in person. Um, so, you know, it's, it's pretty poor. Um, and of the remaining people who also sort of didn't, didn't think it was that bad, a lot of those suggested that although there are some benefits to, to virtual events, they are absolutely um, not a replacement. Um, we asked about sort of ideal lengths and people sort of said two hours. Um, you know, the most common, commonly uh, identified length of an ideal virtual event is, is two hours. So it really kind of, you know, divvied up this idea of, of virtual events and physical events being completely different. So for virtual being sort of short, informative, and very specific around a topic, turn up, learn, leave, um, and physical being about, well, as, as Maria said, discovery, networking, making deals, um, all of that. Guy, I believe you you took issue with with the 53% uh, of them becoming a, a bigger a bigger part of the industry, which incidentally, I agree with you on. Absolutely. So uh, to, to come in on that in a sec, but yes, I also will be attending MIPCOM. Absolutely. I'm attending every event that is live and physical. Uh, I'll be a bit more black and white. I, I think virtual events are completely useless, um, especially for analysts who are preparing the, the presentations, the panels, the questions. Um, the return on investment on our time is almost zero. Um, without the networking, without the face-to-face -face communication, um, virtual just does not work. And the sooner we get back to full physical, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Um, there are a huge number of reasons why they don't work and why the economics don't stack up. And, and that's why I take issue with that 53% of your survey. I think they're wrong. <laughs> I, I think um, it depends when Jonathan did the survey and maybe people were very dramatic a few months ago. They thought, you know, that uh, going back to normal will be difficult. Like people were saying cinemas are dead. Nobody wants to go ever back to a cinema. And now people are crazy with Bond and other movies. So Yeah, but that's just because yeah. of James Bond. It's, uh... Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think I think a factor of that is, is not necessarily people wanting it to be a bigger part of the industry, but an assumption that virtual is, is fairly low low cost to run for the, the big shows. So there's there's an argument to be made about margin there. 
maybe people are thinking about that. Personally, I'm I'm with you, Guy. I would like more physical and, and less big virtual events. I, sure. I think you've got to you've got to think about the reason why these events uh, uh, work. Sorry to to step in there, but the truth is those events are not just about whilst we would like to think of it as the people who give the talks about the information you receive on the talks, they're very much about the networking and the collaboration and the meeting new people and the informal um, expansion that goes on in your mind and in your, in your network through those things. Networking is a big part of it. And the truth is you are, it's almost impossible to network as a, it's actually impossible to network as a, effectively in a virtual event. Uh, there's no tech that I've seen, and I've seen a lot of them over the last 18 months, that actually gives and delivers the same level of opportunity um, to individuals. And those, for those of us who have to prepare uh, as much for a virtual conference uh, as we do for a live conference, uh, it's pretty much a no-brainer that if you're going to give a talk, you would rather give it as an in-person talk and have the ability then to interact with the people who've listened to it, because the return on investment is much higher. I think we're all aware when we're speaking that um, everyone who is listening is on their email, on their iPhone, um, probably on another call at the same time and not giving it their full attention as they would be, not everyone, if they were at a physical event. So it's, it so simply doesn't add up. Okay, so shall we now focus on the events themselves? Because between all of you, you've attended quite a lot of them, both in person and virtually. So Maria, let's start again with you. If you could just give us the roundup of the sort of the events you attended and the key trends you basically noticed there. Yes, so as I said, the first live event for me was NEM in Croatia. And the highlight there, I was doing a panel about sports sports streaming and how important it is today, uh, even in the online space, sports services. We discussed challenges because not everything is perfect with live sports. So uh, we had an invite a guest from the song talking about those technical challenges. But also I saw the big appetite for companies in Eastern Europe to get partnerships with big companies, with big names. And it's not easy for them. It's not easy for the smaller players in Central and Eastern Europe to secure deals with Netflix, Disney, the song, or Amazon, or others. What can we do to help them get in these deals? Because everyone wants to watch that content. Then another highlight uh, from uh, 5G World Forum, one of our informatic events, is the importance, again, of 5G in media. 5G is a topic that comes and goes. But now, again, it becomes very important for media companies because they see that now that everyone is out and about watching content, of course, in the smart TV at home, but also on the move, it will be very important that 5G to allow low latency, reliability, download a lot of content and being able to watch it without mm -hmm. having massive data charges. So lots of trends in all the events, but probably we'll highlight this. And of course, Connect the Ficción Iber series about Spanish production, I should mention this. Spanish content is a hot topic around the world. Now they will realize how important it is and huge investment is going to happen in the next five years around Spanish titles. So keep an eye because everyone is going to make a lot of noise with the Spanish content. Gracias. Uh, well, you know what? It's not just uh, Spanish content. I think local content is a big theme. And uh, the fact that local markets are actually stepping up and uh, building out their production facilities. And we, knew, we know that from... Uh, our Croatian experience at NEM as well. There was a lot of pitching of local resources, facilities, capabilities, and and storytelling. I think. Any other trends you've seen, Natalie? Uh, yes, I mean, obviously, uh, there's a lot of discussion on streaming and where that's going, and we'll speak about that probably a little bit later. But the key thing there, of course, is the you know the nascent and growing AVOD market in Europe, and is it going to start building out as it has in the US. I heard one quote, which I thought was quite interesting, <laughs> which said that, uh, you know, a free offer is, is appealing to consumers. Well, of course it is, it's free, but it's not completely free because you exchange your data and your uh, and advertising. But I do think this is a really important development that we're going to see. And of course, and we'll, we'll talk about that possibly later, the whole issue of consumer shift to streaming, which is accelerated under COVID, isn't going away. Uh, the key question is what will remain uh, 
of the legacy businesses as we move forward and specifically uh, as we see companies who have relied on set top boxes moving into a streamed or hybrid environment. Jonathan, what are the top uh, trends you have noticed at the event? Um, so a lot of a lot of things being discussed, which I will loosely sort of group together under the term vertical integration. Um, what's very interesting is that we've got a lot of a lot of very high growth services um, which are starting to enter maturity now. Everyone's been saying they've been entering maturity, including myself, for about the last last five years. Um, but it does seem that you know those percentage growths are, are dropping and dropping, and therefore um, moving to business models for say the streamers that make better use of their IP, um, and for existing companies that are under a bit of pressure, for example, uh, telcos, even even sort of low margin streamers like the Zone are suddenly thinking a little bit around um, that consumer relationship. So the trend oh, yeah. there is, is not, I am a content seller, I sell content. It is more, I own a relationship with a consumer who currently pays me for content. What else can I do with that? Um, so you, there's been really big headlines that are, that are sort of fairly obvious. So things like Amazon and Netflix going into games. Um, I'm sure, as Maria will be aware, um, when when working with telcos, there's a massive, massive synergy there with uh, in-home um, services, which include things like security. They include things like cloud gaming. Um, there's a there's a big push that in the future, as well as saying, you know, bundling of of, of sort of content services will be a big thing. Think outside content. Um, the bundling of all services. We talk about, you know, subscription fatigue and things mm. like that being, uh, what's your latest thing, Maria? It's about six, six point one or something. I, I can't quite remember. Number of services from the US. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. So that's that's streaming services. But if you actually look outside that, if you look at the number of services in total that people bundle, okay. uh, including things like, you know, subscription socks, the gym, your utility bill, all of those are actually opportunities for someone with that relationship to bundle that into their service. So. I'd say vertical integration, thinking outside the, the sort of content bubble, adding in services that are consumer focused, not necessarily media focused in order to make the most out of that consumer relationship that you're already in. That's, that's my trend. Very interesting. And then uh, Guy, last but obviously not least. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to summarize also my trend from several events, really, with one with one phrase, and that is balance of power. So from um, the work I was doing with Eurovod in Venice, through to my panel at NEM, um, through to the events I've just returned to in Central Europe, the shift in the balance of power um, now that there is the opportunity to bypass traditional operator partners is obviously key to the way that one negotiates um, carriage and, and reach to that end consumer that Jonathan was talking about. What I think is very interesting, um, and as I said, just come back from Central Europe, is, is that there is a big difference, I think, between the view we have in the West, that maybe that balance of power has shifted very strongly to the content owners, and the view they have in Central Europe. And I think in Central Europe, there's still very much an appreciation um, that the operator is bringing something very powerful to the partnership. I was also struck um, this week, earlier this week at the PK cable conference in Poland, how some of the issues that I'd almost forgotten about are, are very much front and center, issues like net neutrality and um, the last mile bandwidth that streamers are able to piggyback on, um, the, the benefits of a wired connection in, in providing service in some of those Central European countries, uh, questions around open internet, the sort of things that I guess we were talking about at cable congresses five, 10 years ago are still very much front of mind uh, in Central Europe. And I think we forget that sometimes with our slightly Western um, view. And I'll just raise one more thing, um, because again, it was something that's not really been on my agenda. 
And it's something, again, that we used to talk about, and that is digital ad insertion yeah. technology for um, as an opportunity for cable operators in particular um, and opening up local advertising. So those are the things I've taken away from the, from the recent events. I agree with what guys said and Jonathan and, and Natalie, but I think another topic guys, that I think will, all of you will agree that everyone setting all these panels is again the increase of piracy coming back. So for some period of years, we, uh, it looks like in some countries like Spain and others and UK, uh, piracy was going down. But now in our recent Omnia consumer survey, people are saying they're getting a bit saturated with many uh, services, pay or free. And now they're saying we're going back to piracy because it's easier to find content on an illegal website than through the subscriptions we have access to. So I think for everyone out there, uh, this, uh, how to discover content, how to make use uh, of the services you have, I think there is a lot of work to be done from tech vendors, from providers to make sure that you offer content in an easy way to your subscribers because piracy is on the rise and pirates are not people they want everything for free. Pirates are people that they pay for cinema, they pay for services, or service shows that they do pay for content. But if they cannot find it in legal ways because the content is not available or they don't know where that content is available, piracy will increase. So again, I think it was uh, discussing many of the panels, content security, piracy, why is coming back? What can we do to protect content? That's right. That's right. And I think I think the big unsolved question in the industry today is how we solve aggregation and cross-service navigation. Um, and I know Natalie, you you mentioned in our little pre-chat how aggregation and smart TVs and Sky's recent yeah. announcement. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a really important development and uh, Sky's announcement is strategically significant um, because one of the uh, tent poles of why it's doing that is because it is saying it's listening to consumer frustration with the uh, fraction, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the fact that, that consumers have all these different devices and all these different operating systems. But the, the truth is that that's following a pattern which I think comes from the US where, you know, for some years now, probably the last eight years, um, smart TVs, connected TVs have been the biggest selling devices. And we've been kind of sitting that with that in the background. But what's been happening now is that uh, operating systems have been following that. And we've seen, uh, you know, we've seen uh, the likes of uh, Amazon uh, a few weeks ago. And of course, Roku's strategy is to be uh, deeply embedded on the operating systems of TV services. It says it's uh, penetrated 40% of uh, uh, smart TVs in the US. 64% um, of uh, ha households in the US have a, a smart or connected TV. CTVs are really what people are asking for. And, they, and so Sky has gone one further and said, we are going to manufacture those TVs and we're going to bring together all the different devices that you need into one uh, aggregated place because we understand aggregation we know it better than anyone and and therefore we are going to step into this place using our content as a sort of tent pole harnesser of everyone's attention but really they're also talking about making sure that all the other devices in the household are connected through that so i think that's a very significant uh very significant uh move and you know behind that is also um the notion that streaming is really where the consumer is going. And so people are moving now to streaming as kind of a de facto, um, you know, default um, method of viewing content. The big screen is becoming very popular. Interesting statistic uh, recently that I saw that said that 52% uh, of YouTube uh, views in the US to the tune of one point to uh, one, uh, 120 million to 130 million um, are actually on the connected TV. So YouTube has now become, I think, the, the number one platform, but it's also come become number two sort of um, uh, uh, place to view on TV content, so and service on, on, on TV. So, so that's, I think, really interesting development. 
I think I think slightly to add to that, um, sort of taking Guy's point about sort of ad insertion as well. The, the other part of, of why you would yeah. invest in a connected TV is because if you if you don't invest and you become a sort of passively aggregated service, such as Sky's channels might have been in the future, you lose control of the device that um, is is being used for viewing. So you lose control of the that. advertising. And if the likes of LG and Amazon are taking over, you know, ad insertion, that means you you you're losing your margin there. You're uh, absolutely absolutely, yeah. and you're using yeah. and you're losing your ability to actually control that environment and yeah. place your inventory. I, I, I mean, sorry, go on there. I don't know what is, I was going to go back to Natalie. What what she's saying about. Uh, YouTube being the most popular video service and also advertising because sometimes you see in one company like Google being the one offering YouTube the most watched service around the whole world in every single country that we serve in Omdia YouTube came number one so some broadcasters may see Google as a competitor but at the same time Google is also providing ad tech to broadcasters to help them monetize the digital world so Google is also a friend for many broadcasters in the digital world. So next year in 2022, more than 50% of all the TV ads will be digital. So if you are a broadcaster and you want to take part of that pie, you need to move quickly. You need to be able to offer to be in the digital space for advertising. So linear addressability, ad tech, uh, programmatic advertising again, but in a different way, will again become hot topics of 2022. So that's another trend, Cassia, going back to your trends. We are seeing. I just raised one more point because I, I also tried to drill into it a bit on my panel in NEM was around uh, data access because there's aggregation that many people are doing from Amazon to Apple to Sky. Um, and that is putting lots of different things in the same place. And then there's true integration. Mm. Yeah. which um, requires co cross-service navigation, which requires sharing user data and metadata. And that's the bit that nobody has cracked or got close to. And I think that's the big challenge because it's what, not, yeah. And that's what Sky is trying to address uh, with, with this in part, because it, it does know how to play in that space. And it has, it's one of the few ag aggregators that's insisted on deep integration with some yes, of yes. I mean, that, you know, as, as we know, they, they integrate Netflix to a degree, but not mm -hmm. to the degree that I think is necessary now that yeah, we are definitely. in this world where households do have four or five or six services, all with different interfaces and navigations. And um, there are lots of, you know, what aggregators do a lot in a partnership. Um, but one thing they do is control the customer relationship and the data flow. And that is the bottleneck. Mm. And, and that is the currency that is becoming increasingly valuable yep. as we move to a streaming world and a, and a point of negotiation in, in B2B relationships. And, yeah. and that has to be solved. We have to find a way to fully integrate. Also, Guy, because not everyone wants to be part of this marriage. So some people prefer to be single because <laughs> in marriages, complications can happen. And I'm talking about... Yes. Uh, I will not give the name, but some video streaming services said it was great to be a part of Amazon channel. That marriage was fantastic. But then they realized, oh, now we don't get any data from our consumers. We lost visibility. We don't know uh, metrics on, our, on, our, on that data. So every marriage partnership relationship has some consequences. So yeah, everyone exactly. should, should choose carefully with whom should you partner, uh, what are the advantages, what are the pros, what are the cons. Uh, because again, in all the panels and events I have been, I have heard stories about the pros, the good and the bad of partnership with big companies and how worried they are about who gets the data, who owns the data of your subscriber, because that data is super valuable. There's, there's another interesting thing when you were talking about YouTube being so you know prominent because they are prolific in actually sharing the data. If you chat with yeah. producers or small ip owners have actually been distributing their stuff via youtube uh, instead of so you know setting up their own little little branded sections on youtube that they rave about the feedback mm. they, get. they get such yeah. detailed granular information and it's great for them to feed that back into the content they're going to be producing next so even if they're not necessarily making you know and that's not necessarily the case at all but the best you know most uh, profitable deals by 
by doing AVOD and AVOD's growing and we know that. Um, the feedback they get is almost worth it, that, that sort of you know cost investment to, to help them decide what to produce next, which they don't get through through big guys, big streamers. And, and and if you ignore that completely, you do so at your own risk, even as a producer of content. And this is one of the biggest challenges I think for independent producers of content uh, today is how do they uh, position themselves so that they don't become a commoditized. Uh, commission in the future and the more that you the less you have access to that data and the more you ignore it uh, the more you're not able then to justify the value of your content and the impact it has on the audiences because all of these platforms are really looking at audiences as the metric of, sort of value and time spent engagement all of that and so that is where the streaming world is going that's how it measures value uh, so if you're not able to speak that language and justify where you're at you run the risk ultimately of having a commoditized product in the content that you're producing. So can I ask you actually following from this discussion, can I ask you uh, again, the importance of the developing ad, uh, ad world, especially the digital ad world. Do you believe, is there a chance of developing a common sort of data currency between the broadcast and the digital advertising? Because at the, at the moment, this is probably one of the biggest sort of issues that the broadcast is still sort of staying with the uh, bar and similar sort of just broadcast focus uh, data points, while the digital obviously is continue developing their own, which are much deeper. What's your view? Well, I think it, it's very different if you're talking about the ad supported streamers versus the subscription streamers, because the measures of performance are very different and the need to share data is very different. Yeah. I think if we're talking about the ad supported, then yes, a common currency is needed and, and it will be developed through traditional methodologies of measuring viewing. If you're talking about SVOD, the drivers for sharing viewing data are, are very different. Indeed, one could argue um, it's not important to them to share that data at all, indeed not competitively beneficial to share that data at all. And actually they're judging their success on different metrics um, around subscriptions, so sign up and churn, which we all used to within the traditional pay TV business as well. So it, I think there's two discussions there, one around the emerging and growing AVOD space, and another one, which is where a lot of the research focus has been set, which is around measuring Netflix and other subscription platforms who are not sharing data with content partners. Mm. Very, very good point, Guy. Very good point. Yeah. But let's say looking from the AVOD platform's perspective, or actually from the perspective of advertisers who would just love to basically be able to allocate their budgets across the board, traditional broadcast advertising and digital uh, fast sort of uh, streamers, what would you say that, you know, the trend would be to help them get well, access to the single currency? You'll have seen um, complaints <laughs> about the lack of development of a barb style um, standard measurement within the streaming space. It, 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 you know, I think it's fair to say it's, it's behind probably where it should be. Well, I, I think there's some, some fundamental issues there. And that is when you look across all of the platforms and Kasha, you know that from the work you do on a day-to-day -day basis, yeah. the only common currency really is the valuation, it's the revenue. Um, you know, how you calculate your views, how you calculate time spent, how you can, all of that is triggered by different metrics. And that's one of the, the challenges. And I know that there's a lot of work being done on that. And there's even work being done on recording attention or on, you know, um, viewing attention. As a, uh, as a metrics. And there's a lot of technology that's being uh, poured into this. So I expect as a trend to see this area um, developing uh, a lot in the next two or three years. And even though we've been talking about it for a while, the ability to record a common sort of metrics is, is improving. So I'm hoping that uh, in the next couple of years, because of the size of the market and as AVOD grows, uh, we're going to see uh, some commonalities develop. So if, so if we could just quickly look maybe at another trend, which is the, um, 
virtual platforms or especially the sort of the rise of the digital uh, marketplaces, which is at the moment is just becoming much wider trend. Jonathan, what would be your view here? Is it something that is here to stay? As you know, Workshare uh, has, has recently signed a, a strategic partnership agreement with one of these um, digital platforms, Eula, who are, who are based out of uh, Singapore, but are a global company. Um, there's, there's been a few of these ticking away for, you know, the last sort of five, five plus years. Um, there was, um, there's, there's a, there's been a couple that have, that have now ceased trading, um, and there are sort of two, two really big platforms left of, of which Vuda is, is one of them. Um, there's sort of two driving factors behind, I believe, behind why um, there are two left standing and the rest are not. Um, and, it, and it sort of boils down to um, trying to replace a lot of the um, awkward processes that take place when you when you actually try to make a deal to buy content. Um, so to put it in perspective, I, I don't know how many sort of producers and distributors are on this call, but if you if you buy a piece of content, if you go to MIT and you say, yeah, I really like the show, I want to I want to buy it, that's the start of the negotiation, not the end. Um, and it will take you, you know, a, a good deal is done in in six months. You, know, you won't be unhappy if you walk away with, with six months having passed before you actually get the rights to that content. Um, and a lot of that is around just a, just a discussion between you know, the requirements of the buyer and the requirements of the seller. So the, the platforms that are left standing are replicating uh, are replicating that. Um, why is that important? Because during lockdown, these were not no longer just discovery tools. They, they weren't just places where you'd go to, you know, browse, a, uh, you know, browse some content and then arrange a meeting uh, for whatever or, or browse a content, you know, half an hour before the meeting that you're going to have in person. They, they suddenly became um, something quite important. Uh, the play, they were the discovery tool. They were the tool used to plug the gaps in your um, in your sort of linear lineup because you, you didn't have the production um, sorry, the, the finished tape that you thought had coming through, because of course the uh, the production was completely scotched by COVID restrictions. Um, so they suddenly became a, not just something that was interesting and, and nice to have, but for for a decent number of um, sort of companies, actually fairly essential to maintain sort of quality. So I think that's really interesting. Um, I have been party to some of the figures, uh, obviously through our agreement, and they've done, they've been very healthy over the last sort of eighteen months. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see how that evolves over the next few years. Um, there have been learned lessons from what's been going on. So what's really interesting is these platforms are now looking at um, not just um, becoming like a, a library to browse through content, but actually something that, that bigger companies um, start to own parts of. So, you know, showcases, mini festivals, that kind of thing. So it, it looks like you know they've they've seized the opportunity and are growing are growing strongly are, are looking to sort of grab a little bit more of the uh sort of landscape that traditionally um sort of events have, have very much very much taken um we know that when we've had virtual film festivals in the past they've lacked a lot of what we've been talking about before they lack the communication they lack the ability to actually kind of get into any detail that all has to be done on the phone so the fact they're now investing uh, deeply in, in replicating that is, is super interesting. I, I would add to that, that one of the things that's transformed and why the marketplace is so important and, you know, um, frankly, content sales is a bit behind the times because marketplaces have developed everywhere, is it creates efficiencies for cost of sales and that impacts a lot of what I would call second and third tier content. And I think, you know, there's a lot to be said for um, being able to sell content that typically wouldn't have necessarily been sold because the cost of going to MIPCOM or whatever is quite high. So I think it actually opens up a lot of opportunities for content that would ne not necessarily have found markets to find markets. And I think that it's quite exciting that we've now got people starting to adopt these, uh, these, these tools and create these marketplaces. So I think it's early days, but I see them growing and having a significant uh, impact, particularly for 
what I would call non-premium content because premium content is so expensive that often, you know, the cost of sale is justified if it's an in-person. Go on, go on. Um, uh, well, I was, I was just going to say, I think there are parallels. I mean, firstly, my view is slightly jaded because I saw the first wave of these platforms in the 90s um, and I remember them well and they didn't last long. I do think there's a place for them with some of the long, longer tail content. I think the issue is, and the parallel is, what we were talking about with events. If you split an event into hybrid and physical you, you divide your audience. Um, if you, and the problem these platforms have is, given that there are relationships in the content business and physical events, what's to stop you finding the content on the platform and phoning up your mate at the distributor to say, hey, I'll take that content. Um, I don't think anyone solved that. Maybe you know differently, Jonathan. Um... So I'd say two things. One is they tend to be slightly cheaper than traditional middlemen. Um, and two, it's a cost of business. I'm, uh, it's, I'm a, you know, they're aware that it happens. Um, if it's a discovery tool, nothing stops you doing the, the deal outside of the platform. But the aim of these platforms is, is to make it easier to do it within the platform than not. There's, there's always going to be, you know, mm. you can't shore anything up 100%. Um, I think it's just viewed as the cost of business. As long as some deals are being done, I think it's okay. And large distributors have their existing relationships, so they can do that guy. They can pick up the phone, but uh, their smaller and distributors may not. I wonder if people from the audience have questions for us because we only have four minutes yeah. left. So oh, anyone nice. from the audience? Oh, it's about <laughs> it's the a test of anyone who's been listening, please. <laughs> <laughs> who's out there? I'm not getting any questions. It's very unusual. There we go. We've got one. I'm not seeing any questions. Does the panel want to ask the panel questions? There we go. Kasia, well, I'll, I'll, I'll read questions. it out. Okay, Kasia, yes. if you read it out. Sorry, I can't see anything. Okay, yeah. as, you each return, as you each return to conversations at conferences, what has surprised you about new winners and losers who have emerged from the pandemic at home usage environment? I think who's a winner and a loser, it depends. So some people will say, cinemas were big losers last year of the pandemic, video streaming services were big winners, Pivot was a big winner because people were crazy buying Pivot titles to keep kids at home quiet. But now, again, people are returning back to cinemas and cinema may become a huge winner and people may become even more fans than before because they will appreciate more the beauty of being in a room, in a big screen, even bigger than the one at your own house, and watch I, content, yes, Natalie, sorry. So I would actually just slightly pivot that and say what we have to think about is lessons learned. And so for instance, with cinemas, uh, yes, we're all keen to, to show that people are returning to cinemas. What I'd like to hear though, is that there have been lessons learned from theatrical distributors and, um, and venues uh, to understand that they need a little bit more connection with their audiences and they need to be able to really have a continuum conversation with them and not just think of their business model purely as uh, transactional box office tickets isolated per, per title. So what I'd like to see is that um, the industry, the, the winners and the losers have both learned from it and are actually going to mm. uh, grow as a result and grow their capacity to get data and really understand the consumer and the and and their and their audiences, so that they don't get dropped into the raven so easily. If there is another uh, conscious uh, that we have only a couple of minutes left. So, Guy, what would be your winners and losers? I, I would just say that um, I think the the winners were obviously anyone involved in delivering streaming to a degree, which I don't think even we as analysts had predicted. So that was a massive winner. Um, I'll just make read out one more because another thing's come through and I think it's a good way to also wrap up potentially from Amanda because um, it brings us full circle about what we're talking about events she is saying last night that the broadcaster digital awards what shone through was authenticity and diversity being together physically would have brought 100% more real content ideas than in 18 months of virtual awards so 
Yeah. Um, that, that's the laser. It, the laser has been getting together and the, the benefits that brings. And I think that's how we started this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Jonathan? If, if I was going to say one, one thing that surprised me uh, was, it's a little bit tangential, I guess, um, is that because everybody was at home, people bought stuff for their home. So everybody bought little smart speakers and stuff like that. And if you take that to its conclusion of what people then started consuming, um, podcasts. So podcasts have done extremely. Mm. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, and it's changed. It's changed in the way the way uh, radio advertising is super. Yeah. Radio advertising yes. has worked uh, to some extent. Less music, less ad breaks, more sponsorship of podcasts and stuff. Like and audiobooks, yeah. podcasts, audiobooks. audiobooks. Yeah. The, yeah. the other thing I'd, I'd, I'd add to that is because people actually invested in hardware that they didn't have before. This is a, a sort of mm. semi permanent effect. Uh, it's not a. A lockdown that's going to revert back to normal people now have the smart speakers they've got the lent behaviors they're going to be listening to, to more of that stuff than before so i don't know if you're a marketing person think about you know targeting specialized podcasts because they're a bit bigger than they were 18 months ago yeah brilliant thank you so much it was all extremely interesting and i will hand over to karen now thank you thank you very much Kashink. thank you karen thank you everyone thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you everyone. Thanks so much. We, I think we could have just carried on all night, though, couldn't we? Especially Guy with his <laughs> hatred of uh, virtual events. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> it was really interesting. And we've got another webinar next week. And then if everybody can join us, we've got an online symposium, our online annual symposium that's on the 27th of October. So if you check out the What's On um what's on section of ctamyeurope.com and you can check them all then. Oh, we've just got one that's come in from Tatiana. Great insights. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Tatiana. And thank you, Amanda, and everyone who has Thanks, questions. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. See you soon. Bye. See you soon. Bye.